ominous introductory music. Do 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 da 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 da. That's all staying in, by the way. Sure. On June 27th, 1844, the United States lost a prophet. Joseph Smith Jr., founder of the nationally divisive Latter-day Saint movement, met his end at the hands of an angry mob who besieged the Illinois jailhouse where he and several of his compatriots were briefly incarcerated. For most of Smith's followers, his death ushered in a period of intense mourning. For members of his inner circle, though, it also ushered in a period of crisis. With their prophet gone, what would become of the people who called themselves Mormons? Who would be their new leader? Brigham Young, president of the Mormon governing structure known as the Quorum of Twelve, immediately arose to fill the power vacuum that Smith's martyrdom had created. The Quorum was a body modeled after the Twelve Apostles, but there was no one among them whom Smith had specifically named as the rock of his church, uh, as Jesus had done with St. Peter hundreds of years before. Nevertheless, Young asserted de facto authority and in 1847 led his followers, sometimes called the Brighamites, in a mass migration from the Mormon capital city of Nauvoo, Illinois, to the Utah Territory. Shortly thereafter, Young was named as the second president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today, the church Young built in Utah remains the largest Latter-day Saint denomination. When you hear the word Mormon, the image that comes to your mind is likely of a member of this Brighamite group, now led by Thomas Monson, and satirized in such pop culture classics as the Book of Mormon musical. Again, though, Young was not the only man to seek church leadership during the succession crisis of the 1840s. Many Mormons, for example, believe that Joseph Smith's oldest son should succeed the American prophet. At the age of 11, though, the prospect was highly unlikely. It was not until years later that Joseph Smith III accepted the presidency of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a denomination known today as the Community of Christ. Among the many others who emerged to challenge Young, some of whom we might discuss on future podcasts, one man sticks out. James Jesse Strang did not simply want to be elected as the president of his church. He wanted to be crowned as its king. Eventually, he achieved this dream on an island in Lake Michigan, and today we're going to tell you how that all turned out. My name is Patrick Reynolds. And I'm Michael Albany. Welcome to Sex Ed. That's S-E-C-T-S Ed. This is episode one, Stranger Things. James Jesse Strang came of age in an era of new religious movements. Beginning in the 1790s, a series of religious revivals known as the Second Great Awakening had swept across the United States, and especially it was concentrated in the western region of New York that Minister Charles Grandison Finney would later dub the Burned Over District. It was here that Joseph Smith Jr. reportedly experienced visions of an angel named Moroni, and this angel directed Smith to the burial place of mysterious golden plates that he translated into what became known as the Book of Mormon. It was also in the Burned Over District where Strang was born on March 21st, 1813. Strang suffered from a sickly disposition throughout most of his formative years, which made attending school on a regular basis difficult. Nevertheless, he was a voracious reader and he had a natural talent for debate. Not everyone in his hometown of Hanover, New York, appreciated this talent, though. Since the age of 12, Strang had been a member of the nearby Forestville Baptist Church, but after six years, he was expelled for expressing convictions that the church deemed antithetical to their doctrines. Uh, on January 15th, 1832, Strang wrote in his diary, Locals call on me to pray and talk religious subjects sometimes, and I consent just to please the people. It is all a mere mock of sounds with me, for I can no longer believe in nice speculative contradictions of our divine theologians of our age. Indeed, it is a long time since I have really believed these dogmas, but every examination leaves less evidence, and I have about given up. By age 18, Strang considered himself a staunch atheist. In diary entries dating to his late teens and early 20s, perhaps the only theme that recurs as much as his atheism is his ambition. He bemoaned on his 19th birthday, I am yet no more than a common farmer. Tis too bad. I ought to have been a member of the assembly or a brigadier general before this time, if I am ever to rival Caesar or Napoleon, which I have sworn to do. Strang was certainly a politically motivated young man. And in 1835, he ran as a Democrat for the position of constable of Hanover. He lost by just five votes. Devastated, Strang worked to refashion himself as a lawyer, and in 1836, rose to the New York bar. It was around this time that Strang also married his first wife, a woman named Mary Abigail Pierce. 
Mary was the sister of Strang's best friend, Benjamin Carpenter Pierce. Uh, Benjamin had moved out of New York by the time that Strang married his sister and had staked a claim in the Wisconsin Territory with his other brother-in-law, Moses Smith. Moses Smith, it's important to note, was an early convert to Mormonism. The early years of Strang's first marriage were unquestionably challenging. He traveled frequently for work, and because of poor health, Mary could not travel with him. To supplement his family's income, Strang took on a variety of odd jobs. He was a teacher, a newspaper editor, and even a temperance lecturer. Meanwhile, he continued to hold on to his political ambitions and eventually secured a position as a postmaster. Throughout this period, Strang corresponded regularly with his best friend and brother-in-law, Benjamin. In his letters, Benjamin routinely wrote of boundless opportunities that Wisconsin had to offer. This intrigued Strang, and by 1843, he decided that his family should move westward to the town of Burlington, which had a Mormon population of about 100. For a time, Strang was happy in his new frontier home. He set up a private practice in Burlington, and locals marveled at his intelligence and debating ability that had earned him so much ire back in New York. Soon, though, tragedy struck. Strang's five-year-old daughter, Mary, suddenly died. Strang reeled in agony. Moses Smith and his brother Aaron rushed to comfort him. They soon introduced him to Lyman White, a disciple of Joseph Smith who was sometimes called the Wild Ram of the Mountains. By the time Strang met White, he was no longer as staunchly atheistic as he had been in his early 20s. His wife, after all, was the daughter of a Baptist minister, and he had started to go to Baptist services again shortly before resettling Wisconsin. Furthermore, he had certainly heard of the Mormons, and he likely empathized with them as religious outsiders who had been driven from New York to Ohio to Missouri and finally to their current base of operations in Illinois. However, it was only at this point in his life when he started to really take their theology seriously. After hearing White preach, he made a pilgrimage to the Mormon city of Nauvoo, where Joseph Smith personally baptized him into the Mormon faith. A week later, Smith's brother Hiram ordained Strang as an elder in the church. Strang's ascent through the Mormon hierarchy was meteoric. He was baptized on February 24, 1844, but in less than 90 days he'd already become an elder and was personally corresponding with church president Joseph Smith. The subject of their correspondence was a future home for the Latter-day Saints. The Mormon War of 1838 had already forced them out of Missouri, and Smith sensed similarly violent tensions in the state of Illinois. Thus, the American prophet eagerly accepted proposals for places where his followers could find peace. Smith even considered founding an independent nation to act as a buffer state between Mexico and the Republic of Texas. Strang, on the other hand, saw the future of the Latter-day Saints in Wisconsin. Joseph Smith, sadly, did not live long enough to offer an endorsement for a future site of a Mormon homeland. As previously stated, he was murdered by an angry mob on June 27, 1844 which set into motion a tumultuous secession crisis. With Smith's heir apparent, Joseph Smith III, only 11 years old, several men stepped forward with equally compelling claims for why they should lead the Latter-day Saints. There was Brigham Young, the wild ram of the mountains, Lyman White, and one of Smith's earliest associates, Sidney Rigdon. These men all shared long histories with Smith. However, another man, who had only recently become acquainted with the American prophet, also arose to take his place, James Jesse Strang. So having converted only four months ago, what right did this recent convert have to assert himself as candidate for the presidency of Latter-day Saints? Well, Strang claimed that on the night Smith died, he experienced a divine visitation. As it was later recounted in the publication called The Revelations of James J. Strang, an angel of the Lord stretched forth his hand unto him and touched his head and put oil upon him and said, Grace is poured upon thy lips, and God blesseth thee with the greatness of everlasting priesthood. He putteth might and glory and majesty upon thee, and in meekness and truth and righteousness will he prosper thee. In addition to the story of his angelic vision, Strang claimed that he had written proof that Smith wanted him to be his successor. Strang produced a letter postmarked eight days before Smith's death to church officials in Florence, Michigan. In this handwritten message, which... Strang later reprinted in a publication called The Diamond, Smith allegedly states, So spake the Almighty God of heaven. Thy duty is made plain, and if thou lackest wisdom, ask of God, in whose hands I trust thee, and he shall give thee unsparingly, for if evil befall me, thou shalt lead the flock to pleasant pastures. God sustain thee. Now I say allegedly because many Mormons immediately challenge the authenticity of this letter. Brigham Young, in particular, 
claimed that the writing style was nothing like that of the Joseph Smith he knew. He condemned Strang as a forger, and when he asserted control over the central church, he declared Strang excommunicated. Considering that Strang had previously been a postmaster, and that this letter after being delivered was picked up by Strang's law partner, I can see why there were a lot of doubts about the authenticity of this letter's very convenient appearance. Nevertheless, this letter in the angelic vision proved enough evidence for hundreds of Mormons to, who followed Strang to Voree, Wisconsin. There, Strang claimed to have another vision. On September 1st, 1845, he said that an angel revealed to him the location of three brass plates, much like the gold plates that Smith said he had translated into the Book of Mormon. This revelation further cemented Strang as a legitimate heir to Smith in the eyes of his followers. Additionally, since the Brighamites had begun their journey towards the Utah Territory, the Strangites were left as a very powerful Mormon voice in the American Midwest. So while Strang and his followers split off over the issue of secession, there were a number of beliefs and practices that did set them apart from the other Mormon denominations. With regard to the Holy Trinity, most Mormons in the Latter-day Saints Church today accept that God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are separate entities rather than one. The Book of the Law of the Lord, printed by James Strang, however, is pretty firm about there not being a Holy Trinity and is pretty staunchly monotheist, claiming, quote, God alone is one, there are choirs of angels, hosts of spirits, and multitudes of men, but God hath no fellow. Strang and his followers also practiced animal sacrifice, which is generally rejected by most Christians and indeed by most Mormons. They drew from the tradition of animal sacrifices in the Old Testament of the Bible. While a more orthodox view is that the death of Jesus on the cross eliminated the need for this tradition, Strang claimed that under some very specific circumstances, the tradition of animal sacrifice could be restored. In the Book of the Law of the Lord, a very early section describes the rites, but the animal sacrifice practiced by Strang and his followers probably isn't what you're picturing. Strang and animal sacrifice was part of a July 8th holiday feast in commemoration of his coronation as king. The rites spell out that each man on the feast day will bring and sacrifice a heifer, lamb, or fowl, according to the size of his household, uh, which would then be sacrificed by the priests and later eaten with bread and herbs, along with the first fruits of each household's harvest. Uh, having ritualized sacrifice of animals is definitely far outside what would have been considered normal, but eating slaughtered livestock animals at a holiday Thanksgiving feast definitely was and continues to be a very mainstream American tradition. And ultimately, the Strangite practice of animal sacrifice doesn't seem that outlandish, at least to me. Of course, when discussing Mormon practices, it's practically impossible to overlook one in particular that steeped the faith in considerable controversy throughout the 19th century, polygamy. Dating back to the lifetime of Joseph Smith, plural marriage remained a highly contentious topic in the Mormon community. In 1842, for example, Smith publicly excommunicated John C. Bennett for engaging in the practice. Bennett, who was considered a graceless vagabond in the Mormon capital of Novu, responded by publishing a storm of propaganda associating the Latter-day Saints with polygamy. No matter how overblown Bennett's claims might have been, though, uh, it's likely that some Mormons practice polygamy in secret. After Smith's martyrdom, his potential successors struggled with plural marriage even more. Young and his followers in Utah embraced the practice, but Strang, on the other hand, publicly admonished it. This was one of the decisions that differentiated his sect from Young's, making it a more acceptable option for those alienated by Young's embrace of polygamy. In Vori, Strang governed as both a civil and religious leader and attempted to establish an egalitarian utopia. He declared that all land should be held by the church and shared for the public good. He also established the Order of Enoch, where church members were encouraged to pool and share their earthly possessions. However, Strang soon became disillusioned with his utopian community. Few chose to participate in the Order of Enoch, leading to its collapse, while several of his allies also rose to challenge his authority. Aaron Smith, who years earlier had helped convert him to Mormonism, set up a rival church while Strang was away on a missionary trip in 1846. Meanwhile, John C. Bennett attempted to consolidate power in Bori for himself through the enigmatic Order of the Illuminati. As dissent rose, Strang thought of relocating his faithful somewhere where they could establish a more stable kingdom of God on earth. On May 11, 1847, he first set foot on the spot where he would eventually construct his new kingdom, Beaver Island. Beaver Island is the largest island in Lake Michigan. If you look at your right hand and imagine it as Michigan's lower peninsula, 
Beaver Island is located vertically between your ring finger and pinky and horizontally level with your middle finger. It was shortly after he and his followers began moving to Beaver Island that Strang completely reversed his support for monogamy and married his second wife, Elvira Eliza Field, in 1849. Elvira was 19 years old, Strang was 35, and for about a year they kept their marriage hidden, with Elvira disguising herself as a man and using the alias Charles J. Douglas and telling people that young Charles was Strang's nephew and secretary. When they came out more openly in favor of polygamy in 1850, this total reversal of Strang's earlier stance alienated a lot of his prominent followers, who simply left the church or went on to join or create other religious communities, some of which we might cover in a later episode. Um, now, Elvira, his second wife, I think definitely deserves a shout out for being awesome in a lot of ways. Uh, she was very smart, she was a teacher, she stayed on as Strang's secretary after she stopped pretending to be Charles, and she wrote for the Strangite newspaper on the island. She spent a lot of time creating climate records from Beaver Island and sending them to the Smithsonian. And from accounts that I've read, uh, she and Strang definitely had a marriage based on love. Uh, my theory is that this relationship is a pretty huge factor in why he reversed his theological stance on polygamy. Uh, they would eventually have four children together, the first of which would be a son who Elvira named Charles after her old alias, which I think is just adorable. Uh, Strang would later marry three other women, Betsy McNutt, Sarah Wright, and Phoebe Wright, the last two being cousins. Strang and his followers justified it by claiming that it was liberating for women, and in cases of real love or need, that women shouldn't be denied the man they wanted just because he was already married. Among Strangites in general, though, plural marriage was very rare, even after he began allowing it. Now, there's a lot to unpack there, and they wrote extensively about it, but that's the basics of how the Strangites came to view plural marriage amongst themselves. The pretty immediate impact that came from Strang reversing himself in polygamy was that he was abandoned by a lot of prominent followers. Uh, for the followers who stayed loyal to him, however, there were some big changes to come. On July 8, 1850, Strang was ordained as king, the title for which he is most often remembered. The ceremony took place in his newly founded community on Beaver Island, in the town of St. James, which of course, he named after himself. Strang at his ceremony wore royal robes and donned a crown made of tin, which had been designed by his wife Elvira. An important point that's often missed when people talk in passing about King Strang is that he didn't crown himself as the king of Beaver Island specifically, nor did he ever claim that Beaver Island uh, was not a legal part of the United States. The kingdom which he claimed to rule over was the kingdom of God on earth. So this was yet another of his religious titles and not a secular claim to rule over the island. The kingdom of God is a very old concept and is very commonly a part of Christianity, but exactly what this phrase means varies a whole lot depending on who you ask. Uh, when Strang proclaimed himself as king then, he was in his view and in the view of his followers very much a way of reconnecting with practices from the Old Testament of the Christian Bible. So while Strang was technically only the king of his church, there were so many of them on Beaver Island, approximately 300 families, that they quickly came to outnumber the few members of the small non-Mormon fishing community that was already on the island. Uh, as the king and prophet of the largest population on the island, Strang, like he had done in Vori, started to blur the lines between religious and civil authority. With numbers on their side, Strangites were able to lock down the civil offices in their new colony. And the relationship between the Strangites and the existing inhabitants of Beaver Island, who they called Gentiles, uh, was not a particularly good one. Uh, that people were not happy with their new neighbors moving in, and tensions immediately arose between the two communities on the island. Having formerly been a printer back in New York, King Strang pretty quickly got his followers to build a print shop on the island where he published his own writings, including the History of the Law of the Lord, which is an important holy text to his followers. And conveniently enough, for our research, it can be found entirely online. Strang also published a book called Ancient and Modern Mishla Mackinac, including an account of the controversy between Mackinac and the Mormons. Now, the controversy that Strang alludes to is something of an understatement. The, the non-Strangite population of Beaver Island were never particularly welcoming of the Strang and his followers. The persecution of Mormonism had been going on in a number of different places before Strang, and his followers split off from the main Latter-day Saints church. And the conflicts that ended up happening on Beaver Island are similar to the interaction between Mormons and non-Mormons elsewhere in the American Midwest. As Strang recounts, the people of Beaver Island uh, tried keeping them out at first by buying up unclaimed land on the island without settling it, just to keep it out of Mormon hands. 
While this effort did mean that Strang and his followers were kept out of the most productive lands on the island, by 1850 they had built a number of significant improvements to their land, built a road, and were doing quite well. On July 4th, 1850, just a few days before he was crowned king, the non-Mormon population of Beaver Island made their first attempt to drive Strang and his followers off the island by force. Strang writes about the night before this attack. The Gentiles had what he called a carouse and went about drinking whiskey and planning an attack for the next day. But Strang listened to their plans and, quote, poured some of their powder in the lake and put tobacco in one of their barrels of whiskey, by means of which those who drank it became excessively drunk. Um, now, from experience, I have no idea if that works or not. That sounds strange to me. Um, the issue of whiskey was also one of the main points that did drive a wedge between the Strangites and the other inhabitants of the island, as Strang had been a temperance advocate even before his conversion to Mormonism, and he and his followers, uh, like most of the other Mormon churches, had very strict prohibitions against alcohol. The next day, the men of Beaver Island woke up after a hard night of partying and went to attack Strang and his followers, and they found that the Strangites were prepared. The Strangites, being, of course, patriotic Americans, and this being the 4th of July, decided to fire off an honorary salute across the lake. This salute included a few shots from a cannon that Strang had somehow secretly acquired, and after a tense standoff, the Gentiles eventually decided to back off. And uh, I think we can both say from experience, having lived right next to forts, that hearing a cannon go off when you're hungover is not a fun experience. The first attempt by the Gentiles to drive the Strangites off of Beaver Island had failed, but it would not be the last, and conflict would continue to grow between the two populations on the island, and they would repeatedly meet in some violent brawls. As the tensions grew, the other big populated island in northern Michigan, Mackinac, became the center of opposition to the reign of King Strang, particularly as the Mormon community proved to be a strong economic competitor, especially in fishing and in trade with the Native American populations of the area. As the conflicts were escalating, Strang became increasingly authoritarian and started making more and more enemies as he tried to exercise his control. He began mandating that all women in his church wear a special kind of pants that his wife Elvira had designed, which, silly as it might sound, somehow escalated to a big point of tension within the church. By 1851, the troubles in northern Michigan had gotten to the point where they had even reached the ears of President Millard Fillmore. A gunboat full of marines was sent to Beaver Island to arrest Strang and some of his followers, and in June of 1851, King Strang went on trial in Detroit on a strange combination of charges, delaying the mail, cutting timber from public lands, tax irregularities, and counterfeiting. Having been a lawyer in New York, Strang defended himself in his trial, and was so effective and charismatic that he was not only found not guilty, but he gained enough positive publicity to get himself successfully elected in 1853 to the Michigan House of Representatives, uh, to date the only self-proclaimed king and prophet to serve in our state legislature. Strang would be re-elected in 1855, but as a state representative, he actually turned out to be pretty normal, responsible, and not particularly controversial. It was his church and his kingdom back on Beaver Island that continued to occupy most of his time and attention. And after he came out of the trial stronger than ever, his enemies started increasing their opposition. Opposition had also started to form against Strang from within his own church, as his declaration that everyone needed to wear his wife's pants was not going well. There's evidence that he ordered punishments for the husbands of women who refused to wear them. One of these husbands was Thomas Bedford a fisherman who was married to one of Strang's followers, but not a Mormon himself. Historical records aren't conclusively clear, but at some point Bedford was found in bed with the wife of one of his business partners and was punished for adultery by flogging. Uh, Thomas Bedford was pretty fed up with Strang at this point, as you might imagine, so Bedford teamed up with Alexander Wentworth, another local who was fed up with Strang, and they decided to take matters in their own hands. On June 16th, 1856, on the docks of St. James on Beaver Island, in full sight of the crew of the U.S. Navy ship, the Michigan, Bedford and Wentworth shot King Strang multiple times while his back was turned. Two bullets hit him in the head and a third lodged in his spine, paralyzing him from the waist down. He was taken from there back to Vorey, where he survived a few weeks longer before he finally succumbed to his wounds on July 9th, 1856, one day after the July 8th holiday he had created to commemorate his coronation. His murderers were arrested and taken to Mackinac Island, where the people of Mackinac greeted them with thunderous applause and cheers. They were held in jail briefly and fined about $1.50, which, even adjusted for inflation, would be less than $50 today. They were then released, after which they went to a lot of parties thrown in their honor. While Strang was dying, a mob of Gentiles came over from Mackinac Island to Beaver Island and proceeded to destroy the community 
that had been built there. They rounded up Strang's followers, uh, who at this point numbered around 2,000, and forced them out of their homes, robbed them, and then shoved them onto ships which dropped the Strangites off basically wherever they could along the mainland, where they were left to fend for themselves with nothing. After that, and the death of their king, the Strangites never really recovered. Some of them converted to other religions, and a lot of them joined up with some of the other Mormon factions that were still around, with most eventually merging into the faction led by the now adult Joseph Smith III, which survives today as the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is also known as the Community of Christ. Some Strangites did stay true to the teachings of King Strang, however, and this religion does still exist today. Their numbers are quite small, in the hundreds probably, but it's hard to tell because they also split into two at some point over who would lead them. Modern day Strangites do not practice animal sacrifice or polygamy, but are required to believe that these things are theologically correct and justifiable. They've never had another king believing that after Strang, God had not sent another one. Unlike a lot of other Mormon sects, they don't believe in proselytizing or trying to convert people, which is why their numbers have kept shrinking ever since the death of Strang. They do, however, maintain a lovely website called strangite.org, which I highly recommend checking out if you're interested, because there's a lot of information about their history on there. One of my favorite things about their website, though, is that the web address, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints.org, is owned by the Strangites and redirects people to the Strang site. Uh, and I'm sure the, the main church of the Latter day Saints in Utah would love to get that web address, but the Strangites just got there first. Uh, the only building on Beaver Island that is still standing from this time period is the print shop, which has now been turned into a nice little museum. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albaney and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is created under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at Leader the Lab for the Education and Advancement in Digital Research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.